Okay, so uh, my name is Dr. Raid Babahani. I'm a consultant, ophthalmologist, and neuro-ophthalmologist. And today I wanted to um, give a talk about uh, current aspects of ocular myasthenia gravis based on a recent publication that I've published. So myasthenia gravis, ocular myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disease where antibodies are produced against the postsynaptic neuromuscular junction, particularly the acetylcholine receptors. And ocular symptoms are very prevalent in myasthenia, and they are frequently the presenting symptoms of uh, generalized myasthenia. And what is peculiar about myasthenia is that it can mimic a lot of ocular motility disorders, which can lead to diagnostic delay at the beginning. Uh, most of the time, ocular myasthenia gravis do generalize to generalized my myasthenia, and this occurs in, uh, <clears throat> in various percentages based on different uh, studies that have looked at this. This is just a brief schematic of the pathophysiology of ocular myasthenia, and the uh, the key here is the production of antibodies. So the acetylcholine receptor antibodies are IgG1 and IgG3 subclass antibodies, and they bind to the uh, postsynaptic acetylcholine receptors at the neuromuscular junction, which leads to internalization of the receptors. And what is uh, understood now is that these antibodies can also activate the complement pathway, which leads to uh, destruction of these antibodies, uh, sorry, the, of these receptors. And hence, we have the uh, new role for uh, complement inhibitors and the various therapeutic options that are becoming available now for myasthenia gravis, as you can see here based on this diagram. So IgG1 uh, class sub, uh, recept, uh, antibodies are acetylcholine receptor antibodies, and they bind to the uh, acetylcholine receptor at the neuromuscular junction. Now, as far as clinical manifestations of uh, myasthenia, the, the hallmark really is fatigability and variability. So the patient presents with symptoms that vary over time, often when they are fatigued, but not necessarily uh, so. And the most common ocular presentation is uh, ptosis, which is drooping of the eyelid, ophthalmoplegia and weakness uh, of the orbicularis muscle as evident by the physical exam. And I'm going to play a, a quick video to demonstrate that. So this patient presented with ptosis and diplopia, and you can see here on the right side, the eyelid is starting to droop when she looks up. And uh, this is a classic fatigability and it's occurring now on both sides. So uh, this is very typical of ocular myasthenia. Uh, there are some more uh, classic signs of myasthenia, one of which is the so-called Kogan's eyelid twitch sign. And although this is a very, uh, uh, a very uh, uh, remarkable sign, it's uh, not always present, but when it's present, it's really uh, very clear. And you can see here, patient is looking down, and as she looks up, there's a twitch of the eyelid, so there's a small twitch upwards of the right eyelid when she goes from down gaze to up gaze. Uh, this is a case where a patient presented with uh, diplopia, and as you can see here, there is ptosis on the right side. So these, this is uh, just a, a schematic demonstrating the uh, directions of gaze. So as he looks straight, there's ptosis, and then as he looks to the right, there is limitation of, of abduction. Also, there is limitation of adduction and a little bit of elevation and depression. So this pattern really does not fit into any particular uh, ocu specific ocular motility disorder or cranial nerve uh, disorder. So whenever you see that, you always have to think of ocular myasthenia gravis. And indeed, this patient had myasthenia and he was diagnosed and he was started on treatment, and uh, one month later, you can see the improvement in his ocular motility uh, deficit. Uh, ptosis and enhanced ptosis, or the so-called 
curtaining, which is, uh, uh, as you can see in the visual, when you, when you see there is a ptosis on the right side, and this patient has fatigability of ptosis. And as I lift, I'm going to show that right now as I'm. So whenever I, when I lift the right eye, the left eye droops, and this is called curtaining. And this is based on the law of uh, Herring's law of equal innervation to both yoke muscles. And the patient has orbicularis weakness. So he's trying to close his eyes really tight and I'm easily able to overcome this by prying his eyelids open. So this is weakness of the orbicularis muscle. And this is also uh, typical of myasthenia gravis. And here I'm using the eyes test, which I'm going to discuss later. And as you can see here, there's improvement in ptosis on both sides after the ice test is applied for two minutes. So we've said that myasthenia can mimic a lot of ocular motility disorders, and one of which is thyroid eye disease. And um, sometimes, actually, these diseases can coexist together. Uh, cranial palsy, whether third, fourth, or sixth cranial palsy, Patient with uh, strabismus and phorias, which is our conge basically congenital form of strabismus, which can decompensate in, in later life and uh, can present in a way that can uh, be mimicking of ocular myasthenia. Other diseases of the extraocular muscles or the muscles in general, such as chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia, and other more specific. Uh, ocular motility disorders such as uh, internuclear ophthalmoplegia. And when it's present in mycenae, we call that pseudo-internuclear ophthalmoplegia, and this can be unilateral or bilateral. One and a half syndrome is, a, is another uh, specific ocular motility disorders for uh, lesions of the brainstem. And Botox injection, which are uh, uh, quite prevalent actually, and often patients would not volunteer this information. So uh, any uh, unexplained ptosis or phthaloplegia, uh, you'd have to suspect botulinum toxin injection uh, given recently, and the patient has to be asked specifically about that. And this is another patient who had uh, uh, ptosis on the right side, and as you can see here, she's trying to look up here, looking down, and as she looks to the left, this eye does not adduct, and the same thing is happening on the other side, this eye does not adduct. So this is pseudo, uh, bilateral pseudo internuclear ophthalmoplegia, and this patient had ocular myasthenia. Skip that. So ptosis, isolated ptosis, so myasthenia can present with ptosis, uh, which can, and as you know, ptosis can be uh, caused by other things such as Horner syndrome, uh, chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia, Botox injection, and Involutional ptosis, which occurs with aging, where the levator muscle uh, disinsert from the uh, it's insertion, and uh, this often can be confused with uh, myasthenia gravis. Now, as far as diagnostic tests in the clinic, uh, we do the quick and easy. Myasthenia, and you basically. Uh, uh, Ask the, tell the patient to put ice on the eyelid for two minutes, and you should see uh, some demonstrable, at least, uh, improvement of uh, ptosis in, in both sides. So this is very useful in the clinic, um, and it can be done quite rapidly. Other pharmacological testing, such as the Tensilon test, which was uh, used previously, is not uh, used now as much because of the low sensitivity, low specificity, and also because of the adverse event associated with, with the uh, injection of Tenslon. Uh, the test also can be false positive in other diseases, such as, such as multiple sclerosis, uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, and even in ischemic cranial nerve uh, palsy. What is uh, being done more often now is oral uh, tri uh, therapeutic trial of or oral pridostigmine. So you basically give the patient pyridostigmine, which is the treatment of myasthenia, and you uh, watch for any improvement of symptoms. Now, as far as um, diagnostic as well, the anti-acetylcholine receptor antibodies, 
is the most commonly uh, 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 the most common antibodies associated with ocular myasthenia. And although they are thought to be uh, of low sensitivity for ocular myasthenia, actually recent publications have looked at that. And with the new radioimmunoassays and the cell-based AC, the sensitivity seems to be higher than was uh, thought to be. So it, it reaches up approximately 86% in some series. And we know that also the seropositive positivity of acetylcholine receptor antibodies increases with age. And if you want to get them, you want to get the binding ones, which are uh, tend to be more uh, positive and more sensitive. Uh, Anti-mask antibodies is the, is the other antibodies that can be uh, uh, associated with myasthenia. And um, the, whenever you have patients who are seronegative for acetylcholine receptor antibodies, you want to look if they have anti-mask antibodies. However, most of these patients don't really have pure form of ocular myasthenia, and they have other symptoms with uh, bulbar neck and respiratory involvement. And although the uh, ocular manifestations uh, were thought to be rare in uh, uh, anti-musk mycenae, uh, some series have found that, that actually they are uh, frequent and the range of between 50% uh, to 96% and can be the presenting symptom actually in about 58% of the times. Now, we do have a subset of patients where they are negative for both acetylcholine receptor antibodies and anti-musk. And these patients constitute about 5% of all uh, ocular myasthenia uh, gravis patient. There are antibodies that you can get if you have them in your uh, institution or your laboratory. And uh, these are the anti-low-density uh, lipoprotein receptor-related protein forces, LRP4. And um, there are other antibodies as well. And those patients who are double, double seronegative tend to be young, tend to be females and have mild symptom. But the good news is that they respond well to treatment. And um, uh, you have just have to be wary that the anti-LRP4 can be positive in other uh, disorders as well that can sometimes mimic myasthenia. Other antibodies uh, that you can get in case of double seronegative uh, ocular mycenae are uh, cortactine, um, and uh, uh, there is high frequency of ocular mycenae and few bulbar signs uh, in these patients actually than the acetyl, classic acetylcholine receptor antibody associated mycenae. What about electrophysiological testing? So uh, repetitive nerve stimulation is a test that is used for generalized mycenae. However, it's a uh, generally low yield in ocular mycenae. Uh, only about 30 to 50% of these patients would, would have an abnormal test. What is more, uh, more useful is the single fiber EMG test, which is more sensitive and more specific. And what you're looking for is you're looking, you're looking for jitter. However, the test is really time consuming and you need an experienced operator to do the test. However, if you, if you can get that test and if you have a, a positive ICE test with it as well, then you'd have a, almost a sensitivity of 82%, a specificity of 92% for the diagnosis of ocular myasthenia. What about myasthenia, gravis, and COVID? So uh, during the COVID epidemic, there have been some uh, cases uh, reported uh, of uh, ocular mycenae gravis, either in association with the COVID infection or with the COVID vaccine. And uh, uh, approximately about 11 pat uh, patients have been reported. Three of them were pure ocular mycenae and one was uh, ocular bulbar mycenae. However, most of these patients are uh, were acetylcholine receptor antibody positive. And there is really no conclusive evidence to uh, uh, to say that uh, the myasthenia was a complication of the uh, COVID vaccine. And uh, clearly the benefit of receiving the vaccine outweighed the potential risk. So uh, it is possible that the, uh, the antigen either in the vaccine or in the COVID virus would stimulate the immune system by way of molecular mimicry and leads to uh, uh, production of acetylcholine receptor antibodies. One could argue also these patients were uh, just myasthenic patients, 
and with the um, uh, inflammatory uh, 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 cascade, if you like, and the cytokine uh, storm associated with the COVID infection, or as a result of the vaccine, their, their diseases just become uh, activated. Now, the other uh, class of medication uh, uh, that one should be aware of is the immune check inhibitors, which are uh, frequently used now in the treatment of various forms of cancer. So the immune check inhibitors are check, pro uh, check proteins, checkpoint proteins, which maintain immune stasis and prevent autoimmunity to innate tissue. However, the cancer cells, they use these proteins to evade the uh, uh, immune response. And what, uh, what the immune check inhibitors does is that they bind to these proteins and therefore they uh, stimulate the uh, T cells uh, and uh, stimulate immunity to cancer cells. Uh, now, this might be beneficial for cancer patient. However, it can lead to hyperstimulation as well and um, the development of uh, several uh, autoimmune diseases. So some of the common agents that have been uh, uh, that can cause this are the uh, known immune check inhibitors such as uh, nivolumab, pembrolizumab, and uh, atezolizumab. You know, other there are other ones as well. So these are uh, PD1 inhibitors, PDL1 and uh, CTL4, uh, CTLA4 inhibitors. Now, a patient who develop immune check inhibitor related mycena usually do so within uh, starting the uh, cycles of the immune check inhibitors uh, after about one to four uh, treatment cycles. However, most of these patients actually have uh, severe manifestations in terms of uh, cardiorespiratory uh, uh, and myocarditis complication and myositis. Now, we've said that most uh, patients who have ocular mycenae do generalize to generalized mycenae, and various series have looked at that, and the figures vary between 20 to 85%. Um, in general, most cases of mycenae with ocular symptoms are just generalized mycenae with ocular symptom rather than pure ocular mycene mycenae. And the predictors of generalization that have been uh, uh, associated with that uh, uh, include acetylcholine receptor antibody, titer, the presence of thymoma, age is another one, abnormal repetitive nerve, uh, nerve stimulation, and the severity of symptoms. And uh, in our own institute, we have looked at uh, some of these, and we've looked at own, our own series of ocular myasthenia, and we found that the titer of the acetylcholine receptor antibody and age were significantly associated with increased risk uh, of generalization. So the higher the, the higher the titer and the older the patient, the higher the risk of uh, generalization. Uh, and there's been a recent uh, systematic review of meta-analysis that looked at the uh, various factors associated with the risk of generalization. And they found that uh, female sex, the uh, antibody, acetylcholine receptor antibody, uh, were associated with increased risk of generalization. However, this uh, meta-analysis was really based mostly and on um, retrospective studies, and there is insufficient quality uh, observational studies to, uh, to clearly identify the risk factors of generalization. Now, as far as treatment for uh, um, ocular mycenae, most of the treatment is really based on the treatment for generalized mycenae because of the lack of uh, randomized controlled trials for uh, ocular mycenae. So the most common drug used is periodostigmine or mestinon, and this isn't really not a treatment, it's a, it's a symptomatic treatment. Uh, it doesn't treat the underlying uh, uh, pathophysiological autoimmune uh, uh, cause of the disease. And it's useful for patients who have ptosis only. It's less useful for patients who have uh, dip diplopia. And the treatment is associated with uh, various uh, side effects. And we do use also oral corticosteroids, particularly for patients with uh, diplopia. And the treatment uh, can be uh, fashioned in different ways. So uh, uh, the, the dose can be... Uh, uh, low at the beginning, and it can be increased and tapered 
And the aim is really you want to use the uh, oral steroids for the shortest period of time to avoid the uh, risk of the uh, side effect. The only randomized uh, trial that looked at the uh, role of steroids in uh, ocular myasthenia was the epitome study. However, this study was uh, terminated early because of the uh, slow recruitment and the low sample size but they did find that oral steroids were better than uh, placebo. Now, as far as other uh, medical uh, therapeutic options for mycenia, so uh, second line immunosuppressive agents are used frequently, and these are uh, these include agents such as uh, mycophenolate, azathioprine, cyclosporin, uh, cyclophosphamide, and tacrolimus. And what's new in the pipeline also is the uh, complement inhibitors. So um, rituximab is not a complement inhibitor, it's an anti-CD20, but uh, eculizumab and uh, uh, xylocoplan are complement inhibitors acting against the uh, C5 component of the complement pathway. And these are drugs that are going to be used for um, journalized mycene and uh, uh, they might have some role also in an ocular myasthenia gravis that is refractory to uh, a, a standard treatment or uh, corticosteroids or even second line immunosuppressive agents. Now, um, patients who have uh, my, ocular myasthenia or myasthenia can have thymomas, and the role of thymectomy for uh, uh, although it was proven to be beneficial for generalized mycenae, the role for a thym a thymectomy for uh, ocular mycenae is rather controversial because of the lack of randomized controlled trials. So um, there have been various theories that looked at that, and uh, one series found that it actually it might benefit and might lead to remission of uh, 50%. And uh, another series found that young age was uh, an independent prognostic factor that is associated with a complete remission of ocular myasthenia patient who underwent thymectomy. Um, however, uh, another uh, series found that there was no difference in the daily uh, prednisone severity of symptoms or the risk of generalization between a patient who underwent thymectomy and non thymectomy. Uh, so uh, the role for uh, thymectomy for an ocular myasthenia is not really uh, completely defined and needs further studies. So uh, to summarize, pure ocular mycenae is rare and can mimic any ocular motility disorder. Uh, the risk of generalization from ocular to generalized mycenae is in the range of about 50%. The treatment for ocular mycenae remains uh, mainly symptomatic because of the uh, lack of uh, randomized control trials for other therapeutic option. Steroids and immunosuppressive uh, ther uh, drugs can be used in cases uh, of refractive ocular myasthenia, especially those who uh, that don't respond to corticosteroids. Uh, the immune check inhibitors are a new class of medication, and they're used in various uh, forms of cancer, and they can cause a myasthenic uh, syndrome. And the role of thymectomy in pure ocular uh, Mycenae is unknown, but it's uh, probably helpful in generalized uh, mycenae gravis. And with that, I conclude my talk.